about a week or so ago, I did a video on the 1984 Monaco Grand Prix, quite a contentious race and it's still contentious today, at least among Senna fans it is contentious, where Ayrton Senna in his rookie season in an uncompetitive tournament was challenging Alain Pross for a win, which is peak Senna really outperforming the car. But the race was abandoned due to the weather. It was also a race that could have seen both the cars at the front of the race retire at some point too, that is if the race had gone the full distance. Prost's engine was misfiring and he had brake problems, while Senna had damaged his suspension, and it might not have gone the whole distance either. It could have meant then that Stefan Beloff, in the only naturally aspirated car on the grid, could have won the race instead, before that win was taken off him for the whole turning the car into a shotgun stuff. But one thing I did say in that video is that this whole race became Prost's undoing come the end of the season, because the 1984 championship was settled by half a point. The turbo era in Formula 1 is one that has attained a sort of mythical status, probably because of the engine figures. Engine figures that seem to gain another 100 horsepower every 10 years. You often see the engine power quoted at being 1400 because, well, that's what we've somehow got up to now. Give it a couple more years and we might be saying 1500, 1600. It's just the way that things have gone. We might start using warp factors by the end of the decade. But what is accurate is that these cars were utter monsters. The FIA was doing everything it could to try and reel these things in because by 1984 the cars were starting to break the four figure mark and to make sure the teams turned the boost settings down, the FIA banned refueling so they had to ration the fuel. By all means crank the boost right up in qualifying but in the race you had 220 litres or 58 gallons of fuel and that was it. Brabham, Renault and Ferrari were expected to be the front runners of this particular season, but seemingly out of nowhere McLaren had turned up with the MP42, a car that would go on to set records and would also be the most dominant car of this particular year. In that McLaren was Nicky Lauda, a two-time champion who had come back into racing in 1982 after a brief sabbatical that had started in 1979. When McLaren signed him they had a hard time convincing Marlborough that Lauda was still competitive and could win races. He won at the third time of asking, at Long Beach. 1983 though wasn't as fruitful given that McLaren was starting the transition from the naturally aspirated Ford over to a turbo power plant. Lauda insisted that McLaren try a turbo near the end of the 1983 season to make sure that the engine was ready for 84 and then they could try for the championship. When the new engine showed that it was competitive they made the final tweaks and got it ready to go in the new chassis in time for the first race of 1984. The McLarens had a couple more advantages on board versus the other cars. It was one of the first cars in Formula 1 to use carbon brakes that had a massive advantage in getting the car stopped. A lot of the other cars were still using steel brakes. The carbon brakes saved weight and the brakes were more durable, but at street tracks or at tracks where it was very hot, the brakes didn't have that much of an advantage. Steel brakes lasted longer in the heat, apparently. I don't know how that works. I'm sure someone will be able to explain. This became a problem at the Monaco Grand Prix that I've talked about before. Lauda locked his rear brakes going into Casino Square and that was him out of the race. Pross, meanwhile, had engine and brake problems, so it's debatable whether he would have actually finished that race before it was called off, obviously. Speaking of the engine, the Porsche-built TAG engine, TAG as in TAG Heuer watches, was able to put out between 650 and 850 horsepower for the race and up to about 950, 960 for qualifying. It was also way more frugal and reliable than the others around it, like the BMW and the Brabham, which was by far the most powerful engine on the grid at that time. And by extension, the Porsche engine was able to survive longer and win races as a result. The Brabham was on pole position nine times with PK that year by virtue of them being able to turn up the BMW engine right up to 11 and then to 12, 13, 14, up to about, what, 997. But the thing was though, Porsche hadn't built specific qualifying engines for McLaren so they were using the same engines in the race that they were using in qualifying and that's why the McLarens weren't on pole as often as the Brabhams were. Basically Porsche wasn't going to build special qualifying engines capable of four figures that lasted for about 15 miles before being chucked in the bin. But that's not to say that just because it was the fastest car it was winning every race. It did have some technical gremlins affecting one or both of the cars seemingly every round. In Brazil, Lauda retired with electrical problems, while both cars retired in South Africa as Lauda's water pump went and Prost had issues with his distributor. Whatever one of those is. At Zolder, the cars were beaten on pure pace by Alberto's Ferrari and at San Marino, Lauda's engine blew up. At the French Grand Prix, Prost ended up a lap down behind Lauda because of a loose wheel problem he picked up before heading to Monaco where Lauda's brakes went and Prost might have also no scored with the misfire and brake issues. 
After Monaco, they headed to Canada, where once again the McLarens were beaten on pure pace, this time by Piquet's Brabham. And then at Detroit, Lauda retired with electrical problems, while Prost was down the order because he'd been hit by Mansell as Nigel tried to feed his way through the gap at the start. At the other street race in the US in Dallas, Texas, Prost had a puncture while Lauda spun off, with Prost having gearbox issues at the British and Austrian Grand Prix before his engine blew up at Monza. But despite these technical problems, the McLarens were winning a lot of races. By the time they'd reached the final Grand Prix of the season, a McLaren had won 11 races in the 1984 season, which was then a record. After the penultimate round at the Nürburgring, McLaren had utterly blitzed the competition. They had 128.5 points, over double that of Ferrari in second place. Lotus on 45, Brabham on 37, and Renault on 34. Like I said earlier, Brabham, Ferrari and Renault were expected to be the top contenders this season, but McLaren had rinsed them seemingly out of nowhere. It was said that any car as fast as the McLarens fell to bits, those that were as reliable finished laps down. Let's test that theory. In Brazil, Prost was 40 and a half seconds ahead of Rosberg. In South Africa, the McLarens were the only cars on the same lap, but Prost was still over a minute behind Lauda. That's because Prost had to start from the pits in the spare car, as his regular one refused to start. At San Marino, Prost was only 13 seconds ahead of Arnu, but they were still the only two cars on the same lap, while Lauda's win over Tombe was a lot closer, 7 seconds with the top 5 on the same lap. Monaco, same gap, funnily enough. The cars wouldn't win again until Brands Hatch when Lauda was 42 seconds ahead of Warwick. Germany was a 1-2 with the top 5 once again on the same lap, with Prost 3 seconds ahead of Lauda and Warwick 36 seconds back. Austria was a 26 second victory for Lauda from Piquet, Sandvoort Prost won by 10 seconds from Nicky, and Mansell was over a mini behind them. And then at the Italian Grand Prix, it was a 24 second win for Lauda, with him and Alboreto being the only cars on that same lap. Finally, at the European Grand Prix, Prost won by 24 seconds from Alboreto, with the top 5 on the same lap. So after all that to and fro between Prost and Lauda over the course of the season, the driver's standings were close. Well, between Prost and Lauda they were close. Lauda went into the race 3.5 points ahead of Prost, while Elio De Angelis in the Lotus still had an outside chance. Just kidding, he was out ages ago, he only had 32 points. With 9 points on offer for a win in these days, if Prost won, Lauda needed second. So the final round of the season wasn't in Japan, or Australia, but in Portugal, of all places. It's a weird thing to think about as we associate the final round of the season in this era being at Suzuka or Australia, but Adelaide wouldn't be on the calendar until the following year, and Formula 1 wouldn't be at Suzuka until 1987. It was Portugal's first world championship race since 1960, when the race was held at the Boa Vista Street Circuit in Oporto, and it was held at the Estoril Circuit which was, for a time, the last stop of the European season before they went to the final two rounds at Suzuka in Adelaide. It's a track that's only 20 miles or so west of Lisbon, so it should have been an easy enough place to get to, to watch a title showdown between two drivers who had utterly demolished the field all year. But only 44,000 people turned up. Later on, there were exclamations of, Caramba, e a polícia, which is the Portuguese for, Crikey, it's the Rosas! As Maurice Hamilton wrote back in 2014, it seemed that the local police outnumbered the crowds when they added an extra day of practice, and the local Rosers, keen to impart some authority on the people, had their canine units all over the place and batons at the ready, just in the hope they'd get to batter somebody. The police got even more power trippy when on the Friday there was a heavy rainstorm that flooded parts of the track. With no track running to be done, some of the mechanics decided that with nothing else to do, they grouped a bunch of them together and had a game of football on the start-finish straight. The police, believing that this was not acceptable behaviour, confiscated the football, only to be met with a rather large brummy bloke with a moustache who vaulted the pit wall to confront them. Mansell got them the football back and the game continued, but the amount of police relative to the amount of people that were there, even on a washout day like this one, was just… excessive. It was overkill. Then later on, one of the dogs bit its handler on the arse. Whether in a car or on a horse, we don't mind using excessive force. Bad cops, bad cops. Bad cops, bad cops. But the attention was taken away from the bobbies on the beat, quite literally if reports are to be believed, when Gerhard Berger went off and kicked up the gravel so violently it injured a nearby marshal. When Berger slammed into the barrier on the outside of the corner, it not only destroyed his car, but the wall as well, and there was a big delay to get it repaired. Back then, turns 1 and 2 were fast, but it was a case of runoff? What oh, runoff? And there was only a little bit at turn 1, and virtually none at turn 2. Things in the modern era have changed. There's now more than enough at turn 1 and a hefty chunk at turn 2, with both corners now much tighter. 
In those days, there was a drop-off behind the barrier at turn two, much like how at Imola there was that drop-off into the stream or river, and the attitude of the circuit owners was, well, we're not paying for that, slow down if you don't want to die. The barriers themselves were bare minimum at best. Hamilton had gone to stand at the exit at turn two, and he'd watched this McLaren go past, and then he'd noticed something hit his foot. When he looked down, he saw the front wing of Patrese's Benetton, because Patrese had slammed into the barrier a few metres down the road, and barely missed him. If they'd seen this track today, they would have laughed in their faces and gone home. So for this race, Prost had to win and hope Lauder was lower than second. With the way the season had gone so far with reliability, it seemed very much doable, and Prost was in a prime spot to take advantage when he took a spot on the front row behind Piquet's Brabham. Piquet had set a 121.703, Prost a 21.704, just 0.071 in it, with Senna in the Tolman in third. Lauda, meanwhile, was back in 11th. He had a spin during qualifying which hadn't helped matters, but he'd also been suffering from his engine being down on power. If this had been in the social media age, there'd be people on an internet posting conspiracy theories that Lauda was being screwed so Prost could win. But at the start of the race, Lauda started to do what Lauda did best, mixing brains with pace. After taking it easy until things settled down, he started to make his way up the field. But it wasn't quite Schumacher at Suzuka 98 or Hamilton at Brazil 21 where it was multiple cars a lap. It took time. Getting to 5th by lap 28 and then got up to 4th behind Senna's Tolman and Mansell's Lotus. Mansell in 3rd was running his last laps for Lotus before leaving for Williams. He'd had enough of the management of the team which was now in the hands of a bloke called Pete War, who had taken over after Chapman died of a heart attack in 1982 which is a video I probably should do, the downfall of Lotus after Chapman died. Mansell did not get along with this new management and had asked for a specific set of brakes to help with this particular track, which War had said he wasn't having. On lap 52, the lap after Lauda set the fastest lap, Mansell's left front brake failed and he went off the road, later blaming the failure on War's decision not to give him the brakes he wanted. Lauda, meanwhile, had only just dispatched with Senna, so he'd gone into third and then Mansell going off had put Lauda into second. The race continued as it did, and the top three come the end was Prost winning, Lauda second, Senna third. Lauda had done just enough, literally, to win the title. We've seen one point seasons before in Formula 1 history, 2007, 2008, 1994, 1976. It was two points in 1999, I think, three in 1997. But Lauda beat Prost by a scarcely believable half a point. That Monaco Grand Prix really undid things. If Prost had won, the title would have been his. Even if he came second, the title would have been his, as he would have got nine for the win or six for second, rather than the four and a half he got due to the race being abandoned. To add to this, Prost had more wins than Lauda, fewer retirements, but after the race, Lauda was gracious in victory, at least for a time. He congratulated Prost on having a great season and said that next year would most likely be his. Prost was just on the edge of the peak of his career while Lauda was getting towards the end, Lauda had initially been sceptical of Prost arriving at McLaren that year, worried about the prospect of a younger, faster driver challenging him, but he grew to accept it as Prost was pushing Nicky to be better in his advancing years. Apparently, when everything was done with like press conferences and stuff like that, Lauda went and found the PR man from Marlborough, who had had all of these posters printed up that said Prost 1984 World Champion, and then called him every name under the sun. It's a bit like when Schumacher and his crew had all those 1997 World Champion hats and t-shirts and stuff made up. I wonder if there's any of that still floating around. It'd fetch quite a pretty penny on eBay, wouldn't it? But some final facts for you. The top six from that race won a collective 13 drivers' championships, and the top three of the podium was almost the past, current, and future of Formula 1. Lauda, who would retire for good at the end of the following season, Prost, who was entering his prime, and Senna, who was yet to unleash what he could actually do. It was also the last win for Michelin until 2001. All three on that podium would also be at least a three-time world champion, but half a point in it come the end of a action-packed season, especially with that contentious 1984 Monaco Grand Prix. As the wise man on the microphone once said, anything can happen in Formula 1, and it usually does. So then, a look at the closest ever season in Formula 1 history. If this has been interesting for you, then do like the video so I know a good job was done. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the fine bunch of lads at Patreon for the support, and if you want to help with keeping things running around here, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces. Like the F1 store if you want to grab the latest team gear ready for the new season. So until next time, I've been Ada Mord, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.